Welcome to the second day of uh, our conference and we will start it uh, with a keynote lecture given by our special guest, uh, Professor Cynthia Haf, who came here a um, long way from Chicago. And um, the title of uh, um, her keynote lecture is Mind the Gaps, Victorian Human Writing Subversion into the Archive. And um, the title of the lecture um, is uh, strongly connected to uh, uh, all life uh, research of Professor Luca, um, who um, research uh, archives, uh, autobiographies and biographies of 19th century women writers and also 20th century women writers, early 20th century women writers. Um, she is an author of uh, many books uh, that we already know. They were not translated into Polish, but we we're discussing them on our seminars. So <laughs> we are acknowledged to them. And, um, uh, well, and what is more, uh, Professor Huck was uh, a director of Women's Studies Program. It is also uh, um, a very uh, responsible and great role for uh, a global feminism, <laughs> and we can uh, learn a lot from her. So, Professor Huff, we are very interested in what you're going to tell. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. It's been a lovely conference, and I'm looking forward to the rest of it as well. All right. Um, in the American writer Susan Glassbell's 1916 classic play of Insight in Miss Prison, Trifles, the name of it, the paraphernalia of a woman's daily life are read and reread from different perspectives with different results. While the county attorney and sheriff scour the bedroom and barn for conclusive clues, the important spaces to them, Mrs. Peters and Mrs. Hale piece together the trifles of Mrs. Wright's life. A broken jar of fruit preserves, unbaked bread, an apron, stitches in a quilt, a broken bird cage, and the last piece of the puzzle, a dead bird wrapped in a scrap of silk. From these fragments, from the past and the house itself and their own experiences as women and wives, the two women see the whole tragedy. A domineering and abusive husband, years of repression and silence, an outburst of anger and violence, and at last, desperate revenge and murder through hanging. Having read this story correctly in the only really important space, the kitchen, through which the men just sailed, Mrs. Hale and Mrs. Peters, in a small but important conspiracy of sisterhood, abridge the text by hiding the dead bird. The men never notice. As readers, they could never get past their script, that is the men, of course, methods and preconceptions. The women, however, learned to apply their own experiences, had learned different reading strategies, learned to watch for the important symbol of one woman's domestic world, learn to read supposed trifles to discover the truth of Mrs. Wright's life. What Mrs. Hale and Mrs. Peters realize is that how you approach a person's life matters, that the methodology for reading it can uncover its secrets. The same is true for scholars delving into the archives of 19th century women's writing, and all archives, I might add. An archive is an assemblage of material in multiple ways. It is ordered, or at least kept, by an individual or family, if in personal hands, if in institutional ones by the record office or library that acquired the documents from whomever donated them. It is also assemblage of materials put together by the women who first gathered and composed them, and it is interpreted by the scholars who delve into an archive looking for the secrets it reveals about lives lived. In this talk, I'll discuss each of the ways the archive function, functions in these capacities and how knowing the provenance of an archive helps the scholar best approach the subversion and revolution that reading 19th century women's writing can reveal. 
Knowing the provenance shows which women were likely to have their writing become part of an institutional archive, how archivists are likely to designate their writings, how women writers create multiple types of archives in assembling their chosen material, and how we as readers and scholars need to look with care at all aspects of the archive. But first, I want to talk briefly about how scholars have methodologically approached, or not, women's life writing, and how looking at similar and different ways biography and autobiography have been conceived methodologically might help us both read the past and construct biographies of women with care. Before the 1980s, most scholars, and that's still true sometimes today, eschewed the archives of women's life writing, convinced that the only lives worth considering were the lives of great men who represented their age, whose writings could be held as exemplary. George Gustorf, in his seminal Conditions and Limits of Autobiography, distinguished autobiography from biography by saying that the former, quote, turned from public to private history, end quote and argued for autobiography status as literature and the autobiographer as self-referential and important. Gustorf says, quote, in autobiography, the truth of facts is subordinate to the truth of the man, end quote. Major early scholars of autobiography, such as James Olney, emphasized metaphors mm -hmm. of self. Biographers likewise wrote about the lives of great men worthy of emulation who contributed to the march of history, but many of these biographers emphasized exterior events as representative rather than the interiority of autobiography studies, even though the new biography instituted by Lytton Strachey and eminent Victorians dealt with unconscious motives. Biographers tended to focus on political and military heroes, men of letters, the heroes worthy of Thomas Carlyle's concept of hero worship, deeming the social and domestic much less interesting and not necessarily truly historical. Until 2010, the Oxford English Dictionary defined biography as, quote, the history of the lives of individual men as a branch of literature, end quote. Ruth Hoberman notes Virginia Woolf's comment that biography has been, quote, too much about men, end quote. Until relatively recently, neither scholars of biography or autobiography have focused on women's lives or considered them theoretically worthy. However, the academic progenitor both life writing disciplines have in common is Wilhelm Dilthey, the father-in-law of George Gustorf, who argued that history can, cannot best be understood through all encompassing concepts such as progress or society, but must instead be seen in its specificity where individuals influence their surroundings as much as institutions or ideas affect them. Dilthey's understanding of history as experientially and agentially motivated jives with feminism's emphasis on the importance of women's experiences and agency and makes way for what is now conceived of as the biographical term. The editors of the biographical term, Lives in History, enthusiastically endorse the current direction and methodology of biography studies, which situates, quote, human experience as the starting point of historical interpretation, end quote. They say, Using the individual life as a lens or microscope, the research methodology of biography functions as a counterweight to abstract causation and conceptual history, using primary sources and the personal perspective to explore, relativize, confirm, or correct existing understandings and interpretations of the past." End quote. Dating from the 1980s as an accepted scholarly methodology, the biographical turn as practice and methodology is significant and potentially revolutionary for helping us look at, practice, conceptual, and conceptualize women's writing because of its emphasis on the experiential, the individual, the personal, and primary source material to revolutionize historical understanding. 
Women's studies and women's and gender studies have also foregrounded women as individuals and in their experiences for quite a long time, actually, and utilized archives to do so for many decades. And the impact of these disciplines on life writing studies has been immeasurable. Feminists have pushed students of autobiography studies to consider women, people of color, and other marginalized groups, as well as diverse and marginalized genres, such as letters and diaries, often found in archives, in an effort to transform autobiography studies from a field focusing on autobiographies written by white, Western, economically secure, able-bodied, heterosexual men, to become much more inclusive of the world's inhabitants and their methods of expression. Craig Howes, co-editor of the influential journal Biography Studies, locates the difference between biography and what has become life writing studies in the former's, in the former's insistence on objectivity and alleged rigor. Clearly on the side of the diversity of life writing studies, Howes, echoing Julie Rack's boom, which is about the popular proliferation of memoirs, see studying commodity production as a possible link between scholars of biography studies and life writing studies. My reading is perhaps a bit more hopeful um, than Craig Howe's in its attempt to use methodologies advocated by proponents of the biographical turn to reread history, especially women's history and life writing. Now it seems practitioners and theorists of biography are joining other life writing scholars as well as feminists to re-envision historical inquiry and methodology. As feminists have long done, practitioners of the biographical turn emphasize its interdisciplinary thrust, citing its use to scholars in a variety of disciplines and approaches in addition to history, such as literature, sociology, and race studies. In effect, the biographical turn emphasizes, like much recent scholarship, a cultural studies approach that privileges the individual and whose impetus can be traced to the advent of microhistoria in Italy in the 1970s. The distinction between beginning with the individual as a scholarly starting point and commencing with an abstract concept such as the family, the nation, or women is significant for whether we read women's life writing at all, much less how we read it, and the conclusions we might draw from our reading of it. Similar to third wave feminism's emphasis on the diversity of, rather than the category of women, microhistoria started with the individual. In fact, the historically silenced and marginalized individual as the appropriate beginning for exploration and analysis. Thus, the concept of agency, itself a very important idea in women and gender studies, assumed historical significance for the practitioners of microhistoria. <coughs> Equally important, while traditional historians set out to write history and its actor's purpose in it, according to a rational, organized pattern of behavior, Microhistorians looked for quirky and unconscious behavior as ways best to get at how individuals interact with and shape their historical milieu. The latter presupposes individual agency and historical revolution by foregrounding the importance of human inspired change in ways that women as historical actors can readily and subversively participate. Women may not have been may not have, by and large, been considered major movers of grand historical narratives, but the approach of microhistoria affords their lives and deeds agency because it takes as its focus behavior that influences history by not adhering to the norm. This is the revolutionary quality of women's writing, the gaps and lapses that reveal women as important historical actors. Finally, microhistorians self-reflexively approach reading history by foregrounding their point of view, by realizing, as feminist theorist Donna Har Haraway tells us, that knowledge is situated. Believing that context matters fully as much for the researcher as for her historical subjects means that the researcher looks at the gaps and lapses in the narrative <coughs> 
and foregrounds her own reading strategies and methodologies to create as thick and complex a description as possible. Like Mrs. Hale and Mrs. Peters in Glass Bell's play, she does not just examine one part of the house, one aspect of the text, or even one text for clues, but looks everywhere. What I didn't know <laughs> when I began reading manuscripts by 19th century women 36 years ago, I almost hate to admit how long it's been, was that fragmentation assumed in multiple voices, exclusion and utilization of space were an important and revolutionary part of any construction of self or subjectivity. The self presented by women composing manuscripts was clearly not the unitary text-based self of canonized literature or traditional autobiography and biography. And because I'd been tra trained to read primarily for content and for the formal properties presented in a published text, the metaphors of self, to use James Olney's term, I was unprepared to use my senses of touch and smell, even to interpret the spaces and gaps frequently present in manuscripts. Instead of presenting a polished, easily discernible kernel, women's manuscripts are deeply contextualized, often family-centered, multimedia discourses. We've already seen examples of those at this conference. So that the self projected in these documents is equally complex. Multiple forms and multiple subjectivities work together so that this collaged and contextualized subjectivity demands a parallel reading strategy. Evelyn Schreiber writes that the African-American writer Toni Morrison presents multiple constituencies in her novels and that this, quote, technique arouses the reader's own multiple identities, end quote. The multiple constituencies, multimedia, multiple context, and multiple persona of women's manuscript construction undermine our usual codified reading strategies born of learning to read print and instead demand multiple reading strategies from a careful, instrumental, and loving reader, to use Judith Federley's term. Federley cautions us that to that to learn how to read best, we must not adopt an antagonistic stance, nor assume that the reading tools we're accustomed to using are the appropriate ones, but proceed more cautiously, trying out new techniques, learning how to care for the text and its writer. I would like to suggest that our position, position as readers of archival women's compositions is a very complex one which requires us to situate ourselves within the text as much as possible, something that the practitioners of microhistoria also advocate. Yet because we have even more difficulty as readers participating in the textual, historical, and personal design of manuscripts than we would of a piece of fiction, we must simultaneously realize our limited position and try to thicken our understanding by engaging their inner and outer worlds. Ideally, how we read women's manuscripts depends on context and situation and the interrelationships among a variety of factors. Ourselves as readers, the historical and social position, position of the women composer, and I don't mean composer here in the sense of music, but of a, of a not just a written text, so I'll get to more of that later the manuscript's textual form, how the manuscript is or isn't written, and the extra textual material possibly contained in it, to name a few. Learning how to read manuscripts is complicated detective work, a labor of frustration and love, a lot of that, which allows us much latitude for interpretation, yet often gives us few clues. To actuate our stance, as friendly explorers of archival text, we need to unlearn assumptions about the value of printed text as well as our training as readers of published ones. Because we have been largely trained to read printed, published material, these texts have been sanctioned as significant by their status as mass-produced commodities. Second, the markers in printed material are clear to us <coughs> whether they are narrative devices intrinsic to different genres or spatial ordering such as paragraphs or stanzas. 
None of these learned aids to reading necessarily applies when we read manuscript diaries. Instead of a printed text, we encounter cramped and faded handwriting, which may be written both ver vertically and horizontally on the page. This is the Austin slide. Um, also, we encounter a babble of stories, meaning that it is up to us to decide which stories are most important. We can become, in effect, co-authors of the text. Reading archival women's life writing, we relearn to be patient, to view repetition as positive inscriptions, which may well unravel aspects of the woman composer's character. To consider textual gaps is frequently pointing towards significant events which require rereading of the text and further detective work. To use Marlene, Marlene Kadar's phrase, we learn to look for the archival trace, looking for the fragments of women's self-expression in unexpected places, in bits of lace and hair, in collections of pictured postcards, perhaps in a box containing a dead bird. Not only are we historically trammeled as readers with the 20th and 21st century perspective, but we also can often gain only an imperfect understanding of a woman composer's world given the scarcity of textual clues. We must then be especially conscious of what we do or do not select as important when we read women's manuscripts, always aware that we may need to shift our reading strategy as a woman composer changes the material she includes. So we have to be very agile <laughs> as readers, as it were. Um, when dealing with 19th century women's manuscripts, it helps to be aware of family context, because women writers often chronicled family events and thus composed their texts with the family as audience. So. Knowledge of this phenomenon can change the reader's stance and research in several ways. This is actually a family tree of the gulps, which I'll be talking about later. Since it might cause her to consider personal documents written by a variety of family members, attune her to clues about major life events of others, as well as the manuscript composer, question the textual construction of the manuscript as its composer chooses to focus on herself or those around her. Up to this point, I've talked about how we might best read primary archival material composed by women. However, there is another important consideration. That is, how does the construction of archives, mentioned earlier in this presentation, influence how we go about approaching them? Microhistorians contextualize as much as possible, as do feminists and cultural theorists, and contextualization involves not only the self-reflexivity -reflexi of the reader of archives, but also the contextualization of the archive itself. Where is it housed? Is it in private hands, found in an attic, possibly? Is it in an institution, a library or record office? What is the institution's criterion of selectivity, which you've been grappling with in, in your own project here. What has been the scholar's journey to locate the archive? Derrida emphasizes the institutional weight of the archives, the archive, but I think it's important to counter his certainty by carefully noting an archive status and how the provenance of any woman's manuscript meshes with that status. Historian Carolyn Steedman underscore, underscores archival work is an archetypal activity for historians, but critiques both Derrida and Foucault equating the archive with state power and emphasizes that scholars commenting on Derrida's archive fever quote, have found remarkably little to say about record offices, libraries, and repositories, end quote. When I began reading manuscripts, I'd set out to read those by unknown women but I found myself primarily reading texts by women whose family members were socially or culturally distinguished, often because these are the ones that have been preserved and cataloged in the record offices or city libraries where the majority of women's life writing is housed in Great Britain. My um, dissertation committee, of course, thought everything would be in the British Library, but 
that wasn't the case. <laughs> um, the location of these texts has two important implications. First, that manuscripts are symbiotically linked to their cultural <coughs> context and cannot be read in isolation from that context. Second, that these texts occupy a very ambiguous zone of authority. The historical context of these manuscripts having survived and been archived due to class both authorizes and deauthorizes them. The families from which these writers came had sufficient wealth, stability, education, and social standing to preserve these texts and later give them to public archives or, as was true in many cases, grant them to the public along with family estates, homes, and other property. Yet they remained archived, important enough to be preserved but not important enough to be duplicated, digitized, and publicly disseminated unless somebody undertakes that as a project. That ambiguity links to their ambiguity of genre. Manuscripts by women are often part of a long textual tradition of diaries, journals, and letters, genres which have, until relatively recently, been relegated to subliterary status and so considered unworthy of serious study. An authoritative text, end quote, what surrounds that text culturally, socially, or educationally, end quote, Fosters an authoritative reading, writes K. Halasek, and for readers seeking definitive readings, these deauthorized texts are non-text, nonsense. Yet the placement of women's life writing manuscripts in public repositories highlights their status as material available to all rather than the privileged few. Excuse me. And although such a public location enhances their availability, it nonetheless indicates some manuscripts are not considered art. This classification might affect how, as scholars, we read these manuscripts, for consciously or not, we may be at pains to prove their literariness, their worthiness. And this predilection may override our ability to decipher textual clues which enhance our reading. Diaries, letters, the ephemera of women's writing are also deauthorized because they're frequently uncatalogued. I don't know how many archives I've gone to and had the archivist ask if I wanted to stay in catalog, quite a few. And, are, and so not even part of the official archive. Both of the texts I'll be talking about are housed institutionally in the University College London Library Special Collections itself currently part of the National Archives of Great Britain and are part of the extensive archives of the eugenicist and Victorian man of science, Francis Galt. In this sense, these texts by 19th century women writers are authorized and conventionalized as contributing to the record of an important male figure, albeit a somewhat horrifying one in many ways, <laughs> Um, who easily functions as representing his zeitgeist. Yet their very existence in a public archives makes these women's stories available, authorizes women in their writing as part of a family, national, and imperial history, and allows scholars to determine for themselves whether what these alleged helpmeets wrote is conventional, revolutionary, or both. The Diary of Louisa Galton, 1830 to 1896, is a fascinating archival text as much for what it doesn't say as what it does say about how a woman in Louisa's situation might construct herself through her text about how she is revolutionary yet conventional. The diary also suggests to us useful reading strategies. Louise's situation and initial impetus for writing were simultaneously common and unique among middle class women in 19th century Britain. Louisa was the appointed chronicler of the scientific achievements of a designated Victorian genius, her husband Francis Galton. And please see Francis and Louisa here. Being a family chronicler was a duty Victorian women were frequently educated to perform and one which often still falls to women today. 
Their prescribed role as family chronicler meant that Victorian women might frequently use their diaries to construct elaborate memorials, biographies in the traditional sense of male family members. <coughs> the parameter, parameters of Victorian women's roles suggest that as readers, we may want to consider their manuscripts using a microhistorical approach. This means looking at multiple contexts, which could include the construction of a family ideology and the relationships of that ideology to Victorian social, cultural, and political events, such as the maintenance of the British Empire or the construction of scientific progress. Certainly, the text Louisa Galton constructs challenges us to consider multiple contexts and multiple representations. The ideology of women as family chroniclers was as, as ingrained for the Galtons as was the idea of raising male members to be Victorian geniuses. And both genders and their respective roles were meant to serve the fortunes of family and empire. Louisa was expected to serve her husband as the scribe who recorded his successes for posterity, a role she inherited from the women in Francis's family. Francis Galton was expected to buttress the raison d'etre of imperialism by discovering and elucidating the scientific basis for the alleged social superiority of British custom. He performed his duty to the empire well, for his scientific experiments on schoolboys, convicts, and the mentally impaired implied connections among class genetics and ability, and Galton's perfecting of fingerprinting, still used today, Galton details, enabled the British ruling class to keep track of the supposed socially misfit. The case of Francis and Louisa Galton illustrates the far-ranging impact of a seemingly insignificant connection between the construction of family manuscript records and imperialism. And such a connection challenges us to consider new strategies for reading and interpretation. When she married Francis Galton in 1853, Louisa did not inherit the inscription of Emma Galton's journal, the text produced by Francis's eldest sister to laud his achievements. Instead, Louisa inherited an annual record kept by Francis's mother, detailing the first eight years of Francis's development, development and accomplishments. Initially, Louisa maintained the form of Mrs. Galton's journal, but quickly her retrospective record became separate pages, one labeled Frank's life and the other Louisa's life. Struggling with her designated role as the family biographer of a scientific genius, Louisa assumes different voices when she inscribes Francis's page, sometimes using I and at other times calling Francis by his Christian name or deleting the subject. <laughs> I love that. Each of her choices, whether conscious or not, indicates how closely we need to look for changes in inscription and consider how subversive these are. One of Louise's decisions particularly indicates the necessity for us to notice a manuscript's spatial form. When Louisa begins to record a joint account for the newly married couple, she writes on her page, the right-hand one, and does so for four years after their marriage, leaving Francis's left-hand page blank. Thus, Louisa <laughs> creates a blank space where she tacitly but revolutionarily asserts her power as family scribe and suggests that for us to unravel all the textual clues it is as important to mind the gaps to read what is not written as well as what is. Louise's uneasiness about which voice to assume, her own or Francis's, suggests that readers of women's manuscripts need to read with care. The clues in Louise's account indicate that her record is simultaneously part of a family record as constructed by others in her own journal where she asserts her independence from the familial imperative. It blurs the lines between biography and autobiography and shows us that hybrid texts, rather than hard and fast distinctions of genre, were the rule for women's manuscripts. <clears throat> 
By writing the Golden Family Record and chronicling the achievements of the Victorian genius, then rewriting it in her own terms, Louisa Galton was inscribing several levels of subjectivity, her own, the families, and the nations, and we can even say an empires. We cannot just read her diary, in fact, women's manuscripts generally, as simply personal texts. Instead, we need to look at the familial and cultural milieu to fill in the seeming gaps in these records. We also need to be aware of our dual scholarly roles. First, as scholars interpreting women's lives, we are constructing their biographies. Second, we are providing witness to their lives, which as current, many current life writing scholars know, raises many ethical questions, including the issue of power differentials and the necessity for scholars to be self-reflexive and use care when reading and writing about women in history. My second example, the archive Galton Family Books, manifest the Victorian's obsession with the representationality of material culture as a supplement to the written text to historicize, contest, and realize three levels of Galton family life inscription. Collected Galton family history, the Galton's place within social, political, and scientific Victorian family history, and Galton family members' individual biographies. This text foregrounds women's biographical acts using multimedia and prods us to consider how that might be useful today for complexly reading Victorian women writers and possibly constructing their biographies. <coughs> Looking at the material and at multimedia or in keeping with life, writer, life writer, writing studies, excuse me, current emphasis on the visual, which has nonetheless uh, concerned itself more with the contemporary than the historical. The two-volume Galton family book is ascribed primarily to Elizabeth Galton Weller, who is Louise's sister-in-law, because the books, handwritten by Elizabeth Weller in 1883, are a multimedia collaborative creation where she was assisted by her son, Edward Weller Galton, among other family members, they beg us as scholars and readers to read complexly and particularly strategies advocated by microhistorians. Elizabeth's multimedia techniques include those used in the album culture of Victorian Britain. This culture was commonly practiced by women from the aristocracy and gentry and uses visual rhetoric well known to the Victorians. Because these techniques help underscore the book's overt ideologies, deeply felt religious belief, a commitment to the virgin interest in science, the evocation of the past, and the social status granted by property, knowing about them helps any scholar better read, understand, and contextualize a Victorian woman composer's position as a biographer and within her society. Elizabeth created these texts within a sophisticated visual media tradition that has recently been uncovered by art historians and scholars of photography. That tradition and its actualization in the books derived from, one, artistic collecting, two, family albums where photographs replace names listed in the family Bible, thereby providing a visual record of inheritance, Three, the carte de visite craze, which swept both Victorian England and Victorian America. Four, photo montage, where practice, whose practice mixes images of photographs in order to create another photograph. And five, crest albums. Example of crest albums. This is an example of crest albums. All of these traditions were well known to and practiced by the Victorians mainly upper-class women, although technological innovation made photography available to virtually everyone. Crest albums featured geometric designs, and when once English printers began reproducing crests of arms and personal monograms in the 1860s, these were readily available for use. Elizabeth Seigel argues that photo collage was a well-established Victorian practice, whose multimedia mixing of at-hand objects resulted in, quote, the convergence of multiple authors, end quote, both those 
who brought into being the materials used, the photographers, the die casters, the newspaper producers, to name a few, and those who assembled them. These assemblers were primarily upper class Victorian women, like, like Elizabeth Galton Weller, who had the material means at their disposal to put together such vibrant matter, and their role in doing so troubles a simplistically conceived role for 19th century women writers. As Patricia DeBello convincingly argues, women arranged albums much as they arranged domestic interiors as social markers, <coughs> excuse me, to confer family status. An astute reader can thus postulate that something as seemingly insignificant as creating archive, <laughs> water, water. Um, family albums shows the Victorian ladies who participated in the co collaborative construction of collage helped reinforce, thank you, <coughs> the rituals of society. The fragmentation of collage also countermands the linear narrative of traditional biography and autobiography. Instead of building to a climax or suggesting linearity, collage suggests a life and multiplicity in the process of being lived. <coughs> a careful, next slide. Um, a careful reader immediately notices the complexity of the Galton family books. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> painstak painstakingly constructed primarily by Elizabeth Galton Weller, who on the book's title page announces, <coughs> excuse me, the Galton family arranged by Elizabeth Ann Weller, 1883. The books perform multiple ideological acts <coughs> excuse me, by using varying media. That Elizabeth denotes herself as an arranger overtly points to multiple composers of the books and to what the role of a Victorian woman biographer might have been. <coughs> because the books are assembled via found materials whose production is collaborative and because Elizabeth explicitly points out <coughs> that she had family, excuse me, um, help putting them together. The biographical act for women in the 19th century seems a collaborative rather than singular act. If this is the case, then a biographer or scholar currently constructing biographies of Victorian women might want to honor this tradition by likewise enacting and recognizing the collaborative assemblage practiced by Victorian women biographers, an act which troubles the alleged linear construction of traditional biography. <clears throat> In keeping with her role as a biographer, Elizabeth Cross referenced, which is a scholarly technique meant to suggest painstaking care and objectivity, elevated subjects, and show important connections. Family documents, such as the books, which were most likely drawing room conversation pieces left in prominent places so that visitors could peruse their contents. Um, Cross-referencing would help that process, as well as emphasize the status of the individuals and family whose lives were told in such important texts. Cross-referencing <coughs> also gestures towards scholarly discourse buttressing the impression of veracity, authenticity, and authority, which Elizabeth as a biographer aims to present. It also suggests that as assembler and dutiful scribe, Elizabeth has admirably performed the upper class woman's familial and social role of fostering her family's national as well as international position, both in the present and for posterity. <clears throat> In keeping with her use of multimedia, Elizabeth includes on the title page pen and ink drawings, and we can see these in the um, projection, of the Galton family homes in Claverton, Worley, and Loxton, as well as of Claverton Church. Including these images nostalgically suggests their familial and social importance and the place of religion in the Galton family. <coughs> 
While the drawings evince that Elizabeth is an accomplished lady, trained in deciding, decidedly feminine artistic activities. Multiple visual markers communicate to the astute, careful reader today, as well as to Victorian readers, who are well trained in the iconography of class and gender, that the Galton family was wealthy enough to own properly, property and to educate a daughter in the desired feminine accomplishments and afford her the leisure to pursue them. It behooves us as readers to mine the visual markers of class, gender, and intelligence included in a family book, available for members of the family to peruse and for visitors to see. Such visual markers fill in the gaps we would miss if we only read the written text, for these show that the Galtons were members of the intelligentsia, the class that fomented the intellectual and social changes so characteristic of the Victorian era. Another equally important consideration for the reader, scholar, and potential biographer of 19th century women's writing and their multimedia construction is the tactility of Victorian albums. As staples of drawing rooms, these were literally fingered by anyone perusing their contents, which underscores their materiality, as does their <coughs> being assembled by hand. Scholars of art history and photography emphasize that Victorian album culture should be considered tactile as well as visual because the body of the loved one was evoked via mnemonic traces. These could be hair or lace, but given the Victorian belief in the power of photography to capture the loved one, photographs also suggest tactility. The superiority can we these are part of the family book. The superiority of photographic portraits to these other mnemonic traces, quote, lay in their capability to be not only an accurate representation of a loved one, but also an indexical trace, a relic of the body of the beloved person, end quote. The role of memory via touch was especially important for constructing a past, present, and future of a particular family but it was equally significant for creating an imagined community of family that would encompass the nation and empire. The evocative likenesses in family albums suggest both spatially and temporally, as well as via touch and vision, a conceptual image of family deep and broad enough to encompass the aspirations of empire. Being a careful reader means looking at these indexical traces knowing their historical and cultural meanings, and not seeing them as add-ons or useless gaps in an archival text, but as much a part of a woman writer's record as marks made by a pen, as clues to her world and how she functioned within it. How Elizabeth <clears throat> performed her role as family biographer is important, and it certainly meant that she protected and nurtured the family name via damage control. The individual entry for Lucy Barclay Galton, Frances Galton's grandmother and the wife of John Samuel Galton, illustrates this. <clears throat> this is a drawing of Lucy. According to one official history, as well as contemporary word of mouth, Lucy was the daughter of philandering King George III. To dispel the smirch on the family name, Elizabeth writes to Mr. Capel, asking him in his next edition of his History of England, quote, to omit the false report, end quote, which he accordingly does. <clears throat> Rectifying the same story heard by Cameron Galt, Elizabeth's son, in Dresden, necessitates Elizabeth's sister, Emma, getting, quote, the testimony of all, of all those still living who knew the facts. This was quite a family dip, end quote. This testimony is included in the Galton family books via letters, allegedly tracing the roots of the rumors and is substantiated by Sophia Galton, another of Elizabeth's sisters, who provides marriage certificates, settlement information, and personal testimony regarding her father's accounts. A number of interesting phenomena that reveal a postmodern approach to representational exchanges between history and life writing both biographically and autobiographically are at play here. One is the blurred line between official history and family history, 
since Capel agrees to alter his next edition at Elizabeth's request, including official documents in a family record and assuming that personal testimony has historical status, also substantiates blurring and gestures toward us employing micro-historical techniques to tell 19th century women's biographies. As life writing scholar Sidney Smith points out in her discussion of Hillary Clinton's autobiographies, the authenticity effect, as she labels it, is integral to convincing a reader viewer that a text speaks truth. And this effect is created through the accretion of data that the culture from which it comes judges to be objective. Official documents, which themselves help write a life, testimony from individuals thought to tell the truth, and histories culturally assumed to be objective all perform the authenticity effect and create truth value. And all are used here by the Galtons for that purpose. As readers and scholars of 19th century women's life writing, recognizing the effects of writers and compilers adhering to truth value deepens our understanding. In the Galton family books, Lucy's reputation, and by extension, <clears throat> that of her Victorian heirs, is also rehabilitated and legitimized by items such as photographs of her sample work or her marriage certificate to Samuel Galton and her portrait, which bolsters solicited testimony from living witnesses, repudiating the false report of her mother's misconduct. In Victorian culture, where physiognomy provided a window to the soul and well-executed needlework spoke to Lucy's properly performing her role as a lady, Elizabeth's inclusion of these visuals convinces the viewer that Lucy could not possibly have had a dissolute past. <clears throat> Elizabeth also uses another common photo collage technique drawing frames around the photographs of the portraits to create the visual sense of portraiture, thus symbolically conferring status. The visual and written texts discussed above are indexical and testamentary, and thus associated with the objectivity granted to law and science, and therefore cumulatively perform the authenticity effect for viewers of the books. The, the visual, the tactile, even the olfactory all make up what we find in women's archives and are all traces that we, as careful readers, need to bear witness to and use to construct the biographies of women composers of diaries, letters, family books, and other texts. The materiality of texts, including their composition as physical entities, their use of collage, their textual spacing, their gaps and lapses, matter to careful readers looking to uncover their secrets to see and understand their revolutionary potential. Their provenance, their composition, the composition location of the archive in which they're found make a difference too. A painstaking reader will also want to read intertextually and look at texts by other family members as well as social, cultural, and historical work that helps illuminate women's writing. Self-reflexivity and a knowledge of an acumen in different reading strategies, strategies including biographical, microhistorical, and feminist, among others, also help the scholar of women's archival texts create a toolbox of reading strategies and potentially write uh, a meaningfully nuanced biography. What I have tried to illuminate in this talk is how important it is to think of reading women's archival compositions as methodologies of process, both our own and theirs, so that we mine the gaps more than we strive for a finished reading. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a lecture that uh, introduced us uh, to your methods of uh, reading and all uh, of uh, autobiographical text uh, that um, gave us not only a methodological background, 
but also a case study of your auto micro history <laughs> way of um, um, reading and interpreting texts. Uh, you told us a lot about a composer and yeah. not a writer. Correct. Tell us more about this notion of composer. Well, um, this is the case, of course, of, of, of Elizabeth Galton Weller, and not only Elizabeth Galton Weller, but also other members of her family. Um, and I think what's important here is the extent to which the accretion of material is literally piled on. So one of the things I didn't talk very well, I didn't talk much about at all, was the use of newspaper clippings. So for example, especially um, for the, the male members of the Galton family, um, which include Charles Darwin, because he's Francis Galton's cousin, newspaper clipping after newspaper clipping after newspaper clipping is pasted into the family book. So it's, it's it's a sheer weight of material, and it's anything, well, maybe not anything, but practically anything that you can think of that's um, an ad hand material object. So hair, lace, newspaper clippings, photographs, drawings, um, they're all part of this text. And then, of course, Elizabeth, as, as I mentioned, um, draws around them. So it's, it's quite a production. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, thinking about a uh, writer as composer, mm -hmm. you need also to change a uh, way of thinking about reader. As you... Yeah. <clears throat> Well, yeah, I mean, I think you need to change um, your reading strategies, that you're not focusing primarily or exclusively on the written text at all, but looking as much at the visual or feeling, um, and I suppose this is an argument actually against digitization now that I think about it. Um, well, obviously it is, because you need to be able to actually feel and smell. It, it, for anyone who's done much work in the archives, and especially with texts like the Galton Family Book, you can smell the objects. Um, <laughs> and that's significant. Uh, I don't think humans tend to think much of their sense of smell as being important, unlike other mammals. <laughs> um, but you need to be able to, to actually feel and smell as well as, as see these texts. So it's really using all of your senses. It also means that we need to learn how to smell and how to touch. Many That's true. Things. That it's not That's true. enough to, um, to know how to interpret and how right. to read a text, but also how to, we need to become um, uh, multi uh, multi readers, multi viewers. Right, and it, and it certainly helps if you're not in an archive where the archivists demand that you wear gloves, which tends to be the case in in the U.S. It certainly, in my experience, has not been the case so much in in Britain, at least not in the record offices and so forth. Um, actually even in the National Library as well. But yeah, obviously you want to have your hands clean so you don't damage the manuscript. But you're right, you need to very much learn um, what, it might, what it means to smell these, what memories they evoke, and, and to kind of cast yourself back if you can. This is obviously an act of reconstruction on the researcher's part, what it, what it might have meant for the people who were 
who were touching, I probably wouldn't be smelling, but who were um, touching the family book, for example, when it was in the home, the drawing room. So I think that kind of, I can kind of envision a cool multimedia <laughs> reconstruction of that. And I'm thinking about um, um, autobi autobiographical studies mm -hmm. um, that, and special courses for people who want to research such uh, be a wonderful um, idea. <laughs> books, uh, that wouldn't be only focused on a text, but would be uh, really inter and transdisciplinary, as um, it may be sometimes illusion that we see and that we smell and that we touch something. Um, as for people who know how to read uh, pictures, they can say, uh, I can um, intuitively uh, say what this text means. And we, as uh, literary uh, professionals, can say, no, we need a special tools to read a text. Isn't it the same when it comes to um, mm, multimedia of uh, autobiographical text and used there? Do we need a, special, uh, a specialist uh, to help us in seeing I guess I would say yes and no, because sometimes what happens with a specialist is that that person, because certain methodologies become accepted, then forecloses other ways of experiencing a text. So I think that ideally, um, one would want a methodology that was open-ended, that directed people, but yet didn't foreclose other possibilities, if this makes sense. Um, now, exactly what that might be uh, in terms of, of touch, because actually looking at, looking at Looking at manuscripts, experiencing manuscripts, is very personal. Um, obviously, there are accepted ways of doing that, and scholars of the history of the book, for example, um, <clears throat> talk about this. But, but it, still, um, it still evokes very, very personal responses, I think. So if you're, if you're um, handling a manuscript, it may well remind you of something that happened, for example, in your family. Um, so I, don't, I, I wouldn't want to foreclose those possibilities, that kind of personal relationship, because then it wouldn't be nearly as interesting. <laughs> Thank you for your really impressive and very interesting lecture. Uh, we admire you for your work on women archives. And, um, Thank you. Uh, I appreciate of your, that. Of your teaching us how to read them, how to deal with them, how, how to work with them. And uh, I, I, I know that we have little time because we have already a coffee break. But uh, one question. Um, I, I was thinking. Uh, I, I thought um, I was thinking about uh, our experience, experiences and our works uh, as editors of such texts. And it's now I am. I am. I, I, I am just asking myself: uh, Do you see any sense to publish such a book, or it is a, a piece of art, an object of art, and we should visit the archive to admire it? <laughs> And, and I have conflicting <laughs> responses to that. Um, I think we should all visit the art, I mean, but of course it's not always possible. Um, 
in the publishing process, I do think that you would lose certain things. Um, I admit, I think it might be hard to find some publisher of the, of the Galton family books, but possibly not. So scans on the internet? Just uh, yeah. online editions. Uh, yeah, that that would, be, that, that would be that would be more possible. But I think that the touch and smell. <laughs> well, exactly, exactly, and I've become increasingly interested <laughs> in the touch and 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 the smell. The other aspects, um, I've always been interested, but I've just become more interested recently. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a you want something like this text to be known by a wider public, but it also, um, well, destroys is too strong a verb, but it also undermines aspects of it, I think. Thank you, so. Uh, sure. I, we are opening. <laughs> um, one question and one comment. Sure. Um, a comment about the smell. So I was actually wondering what is the use of the smell and how can we use the smell of archival materials? Um, when we deal with the text from the end of the 19th century, then the smell that we can uh, sense musty. <laughs> is the smell of a 120-year-old document. And it's not the smell of, of the book when it was written. and. and not a smell that people who wrote and, and used to right. actually sense. So I was wondering what, in what situation can the smell be helping and in what situation can it be disturbing? Because I imagine when we deal with the, with the family chronicle, then, then the smell arouses sentiment and nostalgia, which can be helpful in reading the family right. chronicle. But what happens when we want to somehow have a more neutral um, to, to distance ourselves. Yes, um, I wouldn't say distance, but yeah. Uh, um, yeah, to 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 access a document less uh, sensitively. Um, well, I mean, of course, it's always the decision of the researcher mm -hmm. with how much he or she wants to to um, interact with that per particular manuscript with, her sen with his or her senses. So if in fact, presuming that smell is going to evoke nostalgia memories, and I don't know that it always does, because I think smelling um, manuscripts you can also think of the overwhelming smells of Victorian England. Victorian England was not a very clean place. This is the era, after all, of when, when the sewer system was, came into being. So I don't think necessarily that, you know, it's like smelling clothes and cinnamon at Christmas. That, that you can you can think of the the, the downside of you know I've, I've often thought that if I could be well first of all if I were transported back to Victorian England I'd want to have a lot of inoculations first but I think I'd be overwhelmed by the smells so I don't think it's necessarily one one thing and, but anyhow, to kind of round out what I was started to say earlier, you can always decide not to smell. That is that is the researcher's prerogative. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And one more, one more question, if I may, um, about the use of such books. Um, maybe you've mentioned it a bit, but uh, can you elaborate more about how often would such books be? Um, by family members on what, what occasions, how, uh, how common that was for, for families from this class to have such books? Very, very, very common. Mm -hmm. um, extremely common. So any time that um, an at-home, so that visitors were 
received in the, in the drawing room, which would be a certain day every week. The family, the family books would be um, on the table for visitors to look at them. So this is why you had to be sure that you rehabilitated Lucy Barclay's mm -hmm. reputation, because you certainly didn't want the visitors thinking that um, there was any smirch on the Golden family name. So, yeah. Thank you for your lecture. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I have quite a broad question going, <laughs> going to the introductory section. Um, and you mentioned that in your training as a historian that you were mostly trained to read for content. And my academic training as a historian has come a bit later than you, and I was still taught to read for content. Yeah. And <laughs> as a historian devoted to life writing studies and, and one who you know, wants to explicitly be self-reflexive in my text, I felt a little bit lonely at times in, in some of our <laughs> traditional history departments. So I would love to hear your, your assessment of how how are historians doing? Like, where do you think that history departments in the U.S. or, or even more broadly have have actually embraced this multiple reading yet? Well, what I should say is I have a master's degree in history. I actually have a Ph.D. in English, so right. so I'm trained even more as a person in literature than I am in <coughs> history. But my sense is that your experience is still often the norm, but because there's so much current interest in the history of the book, both in literature departments and in history departments, that there's more training, certainly than there you know, was when I was a graduate student in the 80s, a um, long time ago, <coughs> in, in techniques that um, have to do with senses other than sigh. So we're getting there somewhat, but <laughs> not as much as we'd like. Although I'm probably not the best person to ask about history departments um, broadly in the US. So uh, I am very sorry to close this part of this question because we would like to discuss. I am uh, conscious of it, but uh, I hope we will continue this discussion informally on the, uh, in the foyer. And now we are uh, inviting you for a uh, coffee and uh, maybe we um, shorten the coffee break because uh, it is <laughs> now it's the time to open the new session. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>